This video was brought to you by Taylor Brands. More on that in a minute. The single hardest thing about starting a business is that you have to make extremely impactful decisions too early in the game with honestly too little information. And, and these are company defining decisions. I'll give you $600,000 for it. I'm prepared to give you $300,000. For 10% of your company. Okay, 4 million. 200,000 for 5%. Huh? In a time when your brain is probably focused on building or bootstrapping or paying your bills, not necessarily on paperwork or a legal structure that might not make any difference in the end. The problem is though, the legal structure you choose makes a huge difference in how your business might operate, how it might grow, or how it might be sold, or even in how liable you or your investors are about the mistakes your company might make. I went on this hunt for a simple, plain English video that lets startup founders understand the type of structure that they need, and I honestly could not find any. You can even find hundreds of contradicting opinions online. So I gave our legal team a call, and I spoke to legal firms inside and outside the US to understand how these different legal decisions and legal structures might affect you as a founder in the short and the long term. And here's the stuff that we're gonna go through in this video. First, the basics of legal entities, then understanding which entity works for the type of business that you're building, the difference between stock and ownership, raising funds or funding rounds with an LLC or a C Corp, taxes on each type of entity and the common state and international exceptions. Big disclaimer, this video will not touch on other types of entities because that's not what we put in the title. <laughs> not really, because these are really the two most common types of entities and we don't really wanna overcomplicate it even more. So here it is. So why do we start companies? Let's start at the very beginning. If you intend to sell something, a product, a service, you probably want a legal entity for one of these three reasons. One is because of liability protection. In the US, this entity provides a barrier between the owner of the company and the client. The company can be sued and Americans love to sue people, <laughs> but the consequences of that will never extend to you as an individual or to the investors or to the executives unless there's fraud involved. Number two is taxes. Different legal entities are taxed differently, but the point is that not all of the alternatives will represent immediate personal income. And then finally, because of agreements your agreements with your partners or your investors. If you're working with someone on anything, you need to agree on the rules of the game. How do you share your profits? How much, how do you share your work? Money that different people injected into the business, all of which will translate into percentage of business ownership. And the simplest way to do that really is with a legal entity. There are other smaller factors like credibility or maybe the ability to sign contracts as a company or to access credit, but those are very much secondary. Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand now is the type of startup that you're building. Because the marketing agency, the dev shop, the dropshipping platform, the new social media platform, the new B2B SaaS, the AI tool, they're all startups, but not all of them are created equal. Some are venture backable, meaning that they can and probably must raise money from venture capitalists to thrive, and some are not. They're smaller businesses that don't require large amounts of money to grow. There's no hard rule on this, but venture backable companies generally have a technology component, something that's unique and proprietary. They can generally scale very fast, 100 plus million dollars in revenue, which means that they could be valued at billions of dollars in five, maybe seven years. Generally, they sell a product, not services, and generally they can operate with big profit margins. Again, they're all startups. You're gonna call both of these startups, but we like to make the distinction of calling the venture backable kind startup and the other kind traditional business, at least for the purpose of today's video. We actually have a whole video about that, but that's for another day. Anyway, only a handful of companies fall into that venture backable category. So I'm actually gonna leave that one for last. So let's talk about a, a traditional business story. Let's say that two friends got together to build an e-commerce platform and maybe they're gonna sell, what is that a cool slide? Cool sliding t-shirts, great. No, maybe they're selling, I don't know, they're, they're selling t-shirts or board games or, or blue candy. There are two people in the equation, so we can tick that check. We need a legal entity to agree on the ownership and establish rules in case someone leaves or dies. Rules on what percentage of the company each one gets. Rules on their responsibilities. Just with that, we establish that a legal entity is needed. Now, e-commerce is tech, but it's not proprietary. This candy business can probably make a few million dollars a year, but unless the candy has some special magic properties, oh, tight, 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 yeah! Or unless this company becomes something like Amazon, it won't be a billion dollar company. That means that it's unlikely to go through the VC funding path. 
They might raise some money from a small investor or from friends or from family, but this is not institutional capital and it'll probably be a single round of funding to get off the ground. Again, this could happen later, but it's unlikely. Most e-commerce companies don't raise institutional money. Now, given these assumptions, this company is much better off as an LLC because it plays to the advantages of an LLC. So given this example, these guys are selling this blue candy. Are they better off operating an, an, as an LLC versus a C-Corp? Is, is, is it a better option? They're covered on liability. They're covered on their partnership agreements. But considering their business is smaller, traditional, they can take advantage of the cheaper cost of operation of an LLC. But the biggest advantage for this company is actually taxes. There's a good chance that they will want to collect the profits that the company is making each year and just share them, split them. And that's where one of the biggest advantages of LLCs comes to shine. For this example scenario, these partners can choose to be taxed as a partnership where the profits that the company makes are just passed directly based on their ownership level. So it becomes personal income. And then they pay taxes on, at the personal level as part of their just annual income tax filings in the US. On a C Corp on the other side, the company must pay first a federal corporate tax on all the company profits. And if they then distribute profits to their shareholders, they will be taxed again on their income. And this is known as a double tax problem. But before I dig into that, I wanna talk about today's sponsor, which is Taylor Brands. Taylor Brands is this true one-stop shop for founders that guides them from the very beginning, generating their first logo using AI, buying a domain, setting up your email, basic business documents, permits, business cards, launching a website. You can do it yourself or even use one of their experts. And now also forming an LLC or an S Corp. In a second, you can confirm that your name is available and then get tailored recommendations based on what your business does, how many employees you're gonna hire and what scale you intend to reach eventually. Taylor Brands can also provide tailored recommendations based on your stage from idea stage to whether you're in business or not. For a Delaware LLC, the cost of setup with Taylor Brands starts at around $300 and they offer easy access to any and all additional service that you might need, like your annual filings or bringing new members into the partnership. We made a video last year where we essentially started and built an e-commerce platform in a single workday, all thanks to Taylor Brands' solid integrations and really easy to use and straightforward tool. There is really no quicker or easier way to get started with a business. They offered us a 20% discount on their Taylor Brand plans for anybody who comes from the video. So I'm just gonna link that in the description. And of course, thanks again to the team at Taylor Brands for sponsoring today's video and letting us make this useful, this useful research for you guys. Okay, so let's go back to this. Why would anyone willingly wanna be double taxed? Of course, nobody wants to be double taxed, right? Uh, but you will only be double taxed if this C Corp uh, makes a distribution of profit. So C Corps could also be very efficient, uh, especially if distributions from the business are not expected year from year or in the short term. If there is some sort of exit plan, they could also be efficient. There's a specific treatment whenever uh, somebody transfer shares of a, of a C Corp, someone else with stock of a C Corp somewhere else. Yeah, they could be very efficient also if you have investors for, for, from multiple jurisdictions. Take the companies that we work with for our pitch deck services, for example. Most of these companies are looking to solve global problems with a tech product, and they're aiming at raising hundreds of thousands of dollars in this round, and then raise another round, maybe a few million dollars, a couple of years down the line. That means that they're gonna have investors today, and then a new batch of investors a couple of years down the line. And each one of them is gonna have a different valuation, and maybe a potentially different set of rules on how their investment or their stock behaves. For example, you could have the second round of investors want a clause to protect their investment in case the company goes bankrupt. And what would happen is that if the company has to liquidate their assets, they, they could make a rule so that they get paid first before anybody else, because they were the last investors to come in. This is relatively easy to solve in a C-Corp with a model called preferred stock. But even to understand any of this, you need to understand that concept of ownership percent and how this pie chart is not the way things work in the real world or in C-Corps. Because we always think of percentage of ownership and we have Hollywood to blame for that. 51% of the voting stock. 51% of the voting stock. 51% share of your company. 51% attack. But this is probably the most important difference between an LLC and a C-Corp. An LLC is designed or, or envisioned as a partnership where different partners agree to own different percentages of this company. When an LLC is formed, the document that defines how this is split is called the operating agreement. It's essentially like a rule book of how your company will run or, or who's gonna make the decisions or who's gonna get the profits. So the operating agreement might say that uh, the owners of the company have equal rights to profits and to ownership. And that would look like this in a pie. But corporations on the other side aren't made of 
pies. They're, they're made of shares of stock, and you've heard about these. 40,000 shares. 50,000 shares. 2,000 shares. Well, half a million shares in the bag. One million shares! So C-Corps are almost built to be split and re-split. Instead of thinking as a C-Corp, as a pie chart, you need to think of it as blocks. A C-Corp for those three founders could be structured as a company with 1,000 blocks. 400, 400, and 200, say, for each founder. Now here's the question, what happens if this C corporation, if they wanna bring new investors into the business? Bring investors on a C corp is actually very easy. All the company needs to do is create new shares. So a whole new batch of shares is gonna get created each time there's a round of investment. This means that shares are not gonna exchange hands. They're a constant. As a founder, you're always gonna own the same amount of shares. But as new shares get created, each shareholder's percentage ownership changes. They're gonna own the same number of shares, but the company now has created more shares. This structure even allows for new shares to operate with, with a different set of rules, like the right to vote or these uh, liquidation preferences we were talking about. Each batch of shares can have sets of rules and new shares don't change that. Why is a C Corp much better for multiple rounds of funding? We just need to take into consideration that C Corp were the legal vehicle for designed for most the most complex business operations. So after a certain level of complexity, and I will use just a certain example, share splits, issuance of shares, multiple different me mechanisms that are very, very usual in, let's say, tech business, just to take an example, were originally this, uh, designed for, for C-Corps. So, Otherwise, after a certain time of operation, LLCs might be short in some of these needs that the company may have, and also trying to force the application of certain mechanisms to the LLC may raise eyebrows when it comes to subsequent investors or anyone conducting due diligence in the, in the business. A lot of startups also offer stock options as a benefit for their employees. And then we have a whole video about that if you wanna watch it. So this is essentially what C-Corps are made for. And LLCs are, they're really inefficient at this. Because to, to, to bring an investor into an LLC, they need to be added as a new partner, as a new owner. So the operating agreement needs to be changed every time, needs to be rewritten. A new one needs to be instituted in the company. So what effectively happens with every new investor is the company gets restructured, a new rule book, gets written every single time. And this is simple for one round of funding, and that's fine on an LLC, but it can get really messy if the company intends to raise multiple rounds. It can't be done. They're, they're, you know, a lawyer will tell you it can't be done. <laughs> but it's just very cumbersome because you're essentially trying to pack all these rules into an operating agreement. Now, you probably figured out by now that without stock, an LLC also can't become a publicly traded company because it just doesn't have shares that it can easily sell to other people. But here's the point, once again, it's only a very specific type of company that needs these characteristics. It can be done, alternatives exist. You can even convert an LLC into a C-Corp, but if your intention is the fast growth path, startup to the moon path, you're better off starting with a C-Corp from the get-go. Now we have to talk about taxes again. So remember we mentioned that double tax problem. The C-Corp pays federal taxes on their profits and then if shareholders collect dividends from the company, they have to pay taxes again. That sucks, but it is just the reality if you need a complex corporate structure with multiple shareholders. An LLC, on the other hand, is actually incredibly flexible about this. I mentioned the owners can just collect the profits directly. They, they can pay uh, self-employment tax on those earnings on an individual level. But here's a really cool trick. Anybody thinks that taxes are cool. But the LLC can actually choose to be taxed as a corporation, which actually would allow it to deduct certain different tax write-offs or benefits like employee benefits. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna dig any deeper into that because the question of how to be taxed really depends on a lot of tax math that is super custom to each business. Just remember, with an LLC, you can choose how to be taxed. Okay, so now let's talk briefly and before we end up on, on state and international lines. Because people, entrepreneurs, investors, overwhelmingly prefer Delaware companies. The state has these business-friendly laws. They have experienced corporate courts in case you have to go to court and no state income tax if you operate outside of Delaware. 
Most recently, Wyoming has also become a popular state for forming your company, and you can see Wyoming as an option in a lot of uh, in a lot of platforms that let you incorporate. Why is Wyoming suddenly popular? Yeah, yeah if, if that's a you know a, a platform related choice, I will I will say that it's it's simply because of the ease of incorporating a, of forming a company or a corporation in these jurisdictions. But there's no a specific tax purpose. Again, in modern state tax law interpretation. Yes, uh, the incorporation uh, place of a company is important, but also, you know, the effective nexus that uh, it has economically to that specific state. So, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, different aspects need to be considered for establishing a company uh, uh, state tax obligations in the spite of the place of which uh, that company is actually incorporated. Now, internationally, sort of the same idea exists. LLCs as transparent entities versus corporations. Does that generally apply in other countries? Uh, you know, or what are some common exceptions that, that people should know on, on LLCs versus C-Corps outside the U.S.? I will say that uh, there are. However, in civil law countries, it's not, uh, it's not frequent to find uh, legal structures that on the legal side will provide you with the legal protection and incorporate bail, and that on the tax side will allow you to have this transparency. This means that they are usually not as frequent or used as frequently as business vehicles as in the United States. For any for any international investor, uh, you will always have to look both things. You know? uh, the, the place in which he is actually investing, let's assume in the U.S. and in these vehicles that we're discussing, and then you will need to consider its uh, home country implications for any operation that he may have abroad. So you have always uh, take into account both perspectives. All right, so to wrap up in a nutshell, both LLCs and C-Corps have the liability protection. They allow founders and partners to agree on the business structure and on profit sharing. Now, LLCs are simpler, cheaper to run, and much better at optimizing for taxes because you can choose how to be taxed. And then, of course, you can use Taylor Brands to get one set up in no time. C-Corps are better if you plan to have multiple shareholders, rounds of funding, or stock options for employees. They're also better if your expectation is that your company will scale really, really fast and potentially go public or be acquired. If that's the case, you should check out how we, Slidebean, can help you do that. See you next week.